This is Hannibal here from TheHannibalTV.com, and we have a UFO podcast tonight with Dan Harari, who is an author on both UFOs and the entertainment world. You've been a publicist for a long time, and I'll figure out if you run it or you help run it with a group, but Contact in the Desert, which is a massive... Uh, UFO convention, pro- probably the biggest UFO right. convention in existence. Correct. How are you doing tonight, sir? I'm doing great, man. Thank you very much. So I've been enjoying your show, Alien Disclosure Files, on Amazon. And, uh, you know, I, I'll i be honest, I wasn't I wasn't aware of you until that show. And I looked you up and I'm like, wow, I need to meet this guy. So that's why I reached out to you. And I'm friends with Earl Gray Anderson and Ron James, who are on that show, I'm very good friends with those guys. So I feel like you and I are, you know, two degrees of uh, Kevin Bacon. One thing I'll say about that show is they were supposed to pay me for it and they never did. So Alien Disclosure <laughs> File is using me. I think they've put out five episodes with me. Oh, and well, they never actually th- paid. <laughs> I'm sorry to hear that. There are 13 total episodes. You're You're in quite a few of them. Yes, and right. well, at least at least something has come out of it because I've right. I've met you now and right. We're I'm friends. very interested. I'm kind of obsessed with with UFOs. I'm actually more interested in UFOs than wrestling these days. So so it's always good to make new contacts in that. But I sure. but I'm highly surprised that we recorded those six months ago. Well, they you should probably pay, reach so out. A scoop. You should reach out. Is his name Ron, something? Paul Call. Ron he he claims that they have not received the money from the pr- production okay. company and they're going to okay. sue them if they don't get it soon. Okay. So that's inside baseball. Okay. But anyway, it's great to meet you. Uh, I, I think you're awesome. Uh, I've invited you to be a guest at contact. If you'd like to come, you could be my guest as media. I would love to host you there, but um, you know, if you want to throw a question at me or tell me what you want me to do. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to ask fan questions this. I have a bunch of questions, but this is a question I'm also interested in. You probably don't know about this, but, you know, we had the about a year ago, last March, early March, there was the Chinese spy balloon that was shot down. Then there was three unidentified aerial phenomenon that were shot down. Now, the spy balloon, we saw pictures of it. (laughs) The other three things, one of them that was shot down over Canada, it's like, Nothing ever was shown to us as proof of right. what happened with these. Right. And supposedly it cost 750 grand for each missile that, that shot these things down. That's exactly right. So it's interesting. So uh, I'm not quite sure where to start, but uh, I've been a Hollywood publicist for 40 years. And this is my office in Beverly Hills. And last year, my science fiction book came out right here after they came. And because of that book, I have befriended many of the top UFO researchers and experiencers in the world. And today, one year later, exactly, I'm, I'm friends with them. But to answer your question, Devin, last year, my book came out right with the same week that that happened. So I was interviewed all over the world about my book. And concurrently, that was happening in the, in the media. So like you just said, man. A Chinese balloon spied on America and Biden shot it down. And we all saw it on TV in the ocean off. I believe it was off of the coast of South Carolina. Okay. That was a man-made Chinese spy balloon. Okay. So we all agree on that topic. The next week, there were three, like you said, three UAPs. One was over Alaska. One was over Canada. One was over Lake Huron. They were all shot down through Biden by the U.S. military. To this day, none of those three has been explained. None of those three has been, uh, we've not seen the video from the aircraft pilot. So these aircraft pilots, when they shoot something down, there's video. There's video of, of, of all, the, all their activity. And we've seen zero video. They've never been explained. I, rem- I watched Biden on live TV last year after the third one went down. He said, you know, well, we just shut down that Chinese uh, balloon. And, you know, there were these three other um, uh, uh, items in the sky. And, you know, we shot those down, too. And, you know, we're pretty sure they were balloons. But anyway, you know, the China balloon, the China balloon, the China balloon, the China balloon. It's called 
you know, a good magician deflects. It's like, does the trick, has, has the audience look in the right hand? He's doing the trick in the left hand. Biden deflected, man. He did not explain those three. And here's what's interesting to this day, a year later, no major media has asked him, hey, what were those items? What were they? Can we see the footage? To this day, they've never been explained. Clearly, they were not man-made objects. They were not Chinese balloons. They were unidentified craft. And uh, it's been over a year, and they've never been explained. So I agree with you. I've been concerned about this myself. In fact, I wrote to a number of senators and congressmen last year and said, um, can you please let us know what those were? And nobody even wrote me back. Yeah, I, I always found that very interesting uh, that, that everyone's just kind of forgotten about it. But like these were highly expensive missiles. And, and for the people that, that allege, and we never saw the pictures, right. that these were somehow... <laughs> just hobby balloons like give me a break how does the navy make a mistake and didn't one of them take two balloon uh two missiles to shoot down it's like that how I'm do you not... miss a spy balloon or a, or a hobby balloon i'm not sure i think one of them was a, a very large oval shaped craft um yeah yeah i think i think i think biden said yeah you know one was a hobby balloon oh come on these this were if there was a hobby balloon they would have got it they would have fished it out of lake huron right and they would have shown it on tv it was absolutely deflection, Devin, man. They never, they have yet to explain. They were unidentified. Now, were they alien? I, we don't know. We don't know, maybe. But they were certainly never explained. And if they were Chinese or Russian or Korean, I believe they, they would have been on CNN and they would have said, hey, look, China's or Russia spying on us. Uh, I don't think we'll ever know until disclosure happens. Ross Coulthart had said that the one that was shot down over Alaska through his through his insiders said that that one was a silvery cylindrical yeah 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 object think, right cylindrical that's correct i heard all right that's right yeah wouldn't you love wouldn't you love to see the videos from those pilots right because you know it exists would that be the coolest the coolest videos ever it, they just don't want us to know that the, the disclosure movement is still going strong that they don't want us to know the pentagon a few weeks ago said oh you know there's no alien tech Okay. My father worked on alien tech in the fifties. Okay. Uh, after my father died, I found out what he did. In fact, it's inspired my book. My father helped invent military drones for the U S army using recovered extraterrestrial technology. I know this for a fact. Okay. So if the Pentagon is saying there's no such thing, tell that to my father who in the fifties was shown alien tech in the vaults at Fort Monmouth, New Jersey, my mother said he came home shaking. He said, I saw something top secret. I could never tell anyone as long as I live. He never told anyone. But my mother said he was never the same after that. So it's all bull. bull. I don't know if I can say the word, but it's all BS, man. It's all it's all absolute BS. And as far as the footage, even I think it's the Tic Tac episode, uh, the Tic Tac footage, you hear the uh, the pilots say there's a whole fleet of them. So obviously right. there's more footage. <laughs> Than just the tic tac oh yeah yeah there's you know there's 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 80 years there's 80 years i mean there uh, you know i'm sure you know the battle of los angeles 1942 there's the a ufo over the coast i live in beverly hills but uh, la over uh, off the coast of santa santa monica a few two months after pearl harbor there was a U giant ufo over the coast of santa monica and they shot thousands of artillery rounds at it it was on the front page of the LA Times. There's a very famous photo of eight very bright spotlights shining on this object. And I more recently heard that they, they, that they got it. They, they, they found it in the ocean or something. But the U.S. government's known since the, at least since the 40s. At least. That was 1942. Foo Fighters in World War II. Foo Fighters. Our American pilots and the, and the German pilots. From 42 to 45 during World War II, both sides saw flying orange orbs for years, tailing and, 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 and playing with military planes from both sides, America and the Nazis. Americans <laughs> thought it was a Nazi super weapon. The Nazis thought it was an American weapon. This is from the 40s. President Roosevelt has written memos about um, uh, intelligent uh, not, uh, intelligent life, not from uh, planet Earth, Roosevelt. 
Uh, Truman certainly knew because Roswell happened on his watch, 47. Truman created the Majestic 12 group to cover that up. He was told all about it. That was uh, July, June or July, July uh, 47. That crash happened. The fort announced that they had a flying saucer. It ran all over the world. That news ran all over the world. The next day, they had to retract that story because Truman and his cronies in Washington, their heads exploded. And they were like, who are these guys at Roswell to tell the world that there's UFOs? Now, I have recently come up with this great idea to have, get Devin. Tell me what you think about this for a movie. The Roswell people call President Truman, right? Mr. President, we have a craft. We have dead bodies. We have one living being. It's July 47. What would you like us to do, Mr. President? Truman goes, hold on. Don't do anything. I'm coming right out. I'll be there tomorrow. He's there the next day. He looks at everything. He goes on live. Uh, there, I don't know that there was television then. He goes on live radio. People of the world, this is President Truman. I'm with a UFO. I, we have recovered alien bodies and a living being from another planet. This stuff is real. We are not alone on the earth. And we wanted to share this information with you. Well, if that had happened on that day, on day one, that would have been disclosure day one. And the last 80 years of, of world history would have been dramatically different. I want to shop that around to a Hollywood producer because I think that's an incredible story. That would be interesting for sure. we got another fan question on here. He wants to know if you feel the UFO technology changes over time. It seems to be more drone type things when it used to be spaceships with window. We did see more of the saucers in the past, but it seems like there's a whole... There's the there's the triangles. There's the cylinders now. Um, yeah, answer away. Oh, sure. Okay. Well, I know. All right. My dad. I have to answer because of my dad. My dad worked for the U.S. Army, 1951 to 1996. My father was an electronics engineer and a physicist. He was a genius. Okay. He worked for Fort Monmouth, New Jersey, 45 years, top secret, high clear, high, top clearance. He gave talks at the Pentagon. He went to White Sand, Sands Missile Testing Range. My mother said he went there all the time for years and years to test drones and missiles and radar. Now, here's my story, Devin, and this is the story that made me kind of famous. In 19, March 1970, I was 14 years old. I'm in my father's car. He's driving me home from school, and it's daylight. And, and, and as we're driving home on my street in suburban New Jersey, a huge silver V, like V, like letter V, like Victor, craft, huge craft was hovering over my father's car, okay? Each wing of the V was the size of two school buses. It was two or 300 feet directly in the sky. I'm 14. I go, Dad, stop the car. Stop the car, Dad. There's a UFO. Stop the car. We stop the car. We get out. We get it in the front of the car. We're looking. I'm jumping up and down. Dad. Isn't this great? Isn't this cool, Dad? A UFO, a UFO. We're seeing a UFO. My father looked at it, Devin, like, <whistles> he, like he looked at his watch. He's looking at his shoes. He's looking down, bored to tears, bored to tears. If you and I, Devin, saw that, we would be hugging and kissing, okay, and taking pictures and, and, and hysterically crying and laughing. My father was bored. I forgot that story happened for 47 years, completely forgot for 47 years. My father died in 2017. I went to a deli to get a pastrami sandwich. I'm sitting there, a beam of energy, and this is true, beamed into my head from above. I swear to you, this is true. Beamed into my head and through my eyes and my brain, I saw the whole movie like this of the 1970 UFO sighting I'd had with my father. It played for me in a deli. 47 years later, I watched it, like projected in the air, like a hologram. And in the t this time when I saw it, I realized at the end of that little video, my father winked at me, he winked at me. And then he said, let's go home. After he died, I realized I discovered my father. I researched him and where he worked. He worked at a place called Fort Monmouth. They invented, they have over 4,000 patents for military Missiles, radars, drones, all kinds of things. They were involved with the Manhattan Project. I didn't know that. 
My father was deeply involved with the development of military drones. I know that for a fact. I have written proof about that. Other people have told me. So I didn't know any of this. My father never spoke about his work ever. Great guy, loved him dearly. After he died, I found out who my father was, okay? To answer the question from your fan, my dad worked before the digital age, before the digital era. He retired in 96. You know, we, we all went online. We all, you know, AOL online was what, 94, 95, 96? That's when my father retired. My father was an analog guy. My father invented drones with analog technology, like radio tubes and old, old stuff like that. So, of course, the technology has dramatically changed. My father would be amazed if he saw some of the drones that were happening now. But to get back to my story, I believe the Silver V craft that my father and I saw in 1970, I really believe my dad knew what it was. He knew what that was. I think it was a military drone from Fort Monmouth. I think he was involved in the design of it or the construction of it or something. He knew what it was, man, because he was bored. He looked at it like he'd seen it 1,000 times. And when he winked at me, that was my father saying, Danny, I can't tell you what that is, but I know what that is. And I'm really sorry I can't share that information with you. So, of course, the technology has changed dramatically, and uh, my father would be the first person to tell you that. So you, you discovered uh, you had this vision about your your father. Yeah, you went back in time to that situation. In between, were you at all interested in UFOs, or was this when you became interested? Okay, it's a really great question. I'll, I'll I'll do this very quickly. So 1970, that was the event with my dad. Okay, I was 14, and then I truly, Devin, I forgot about it completely. Okay. Because why? I, I'm a drummer. You see my drums back there. I had long hair. I was in rock bands. I was playing drums, rock and roll, and chasing girls and going to rock concerts. I worked with Bruce Springsteen. I worked with Kiss. I worked with Fleetwood Mac. I worked at a rock concert hall all through high school. So I was a rocker, man. I wasn't thinking about UFOs at all. The next thing after 1970 was 2007. 2007, I went to a bookstore. I saw the paranormal book section. I said, wow, what's all this? Crop circles, Bigfoot, aliens, the pyramids, uh, uh, Nazca lines. I, and I, honest to God, I didn't know about any of those things. I really didn't. So in 07, I bought about a dozen books all at once. I went home. I read all those books. Richard Dolan's book, Whitley Strieber's book, Zechariah Sitchin's book, uh, 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 Betty and Barney Hill. I, I'm like, wow. How, how come I never knew any of these stories? So that was 07. I joined MUFON, MUFON LA. MUFON has a chapter in LA, Southern California. I joined in 07. My very first MUFON meeting ever. I got unbelievably lucky. The guest speaker was Giorgio Tsoukalos. This is two years before the Ancient Aliens TV show even existed. I saw Giorgio Tsoukalos with about a dozen people have a private 90-minute session. And I was like this, and he's telling us ancient alien theory and the crop circles and the Nazca lines and, and petroglyphs and, and cave drawings of aliens all over the world for the last 50,000 years. And I couldn't even believe what I, was, what I was seeing. Literally, at the end of that talk, I went up to Giorgio. I shook his head. I said, Giorgio, you just changed my entire worldview. And he said, cool, man. Thanks. And I swear that's true. That was 07. One year later, oh, 08, at another MUFON meeting, a guy named James Gilliland spoke. Devin, do you know who James Gilliland is? I am not familiar with him, no. Are you, have you heard of the E. SETI Ranch, E C E T I Ranch in no. Washington? Oh, man, you no. got to go. You got to go there. Okay. The E. SETI Ranch, Washington State, it's at the base of Mount Adams. It's a world famous UFO hotspot for hundreds of years. The Indians used to call Mount Adams the mountain of shining lights because UFOs come in and out of the mountain for hundreds of years. James Gilliland spoke at MUFON 08. I went with a girlfriend. I heard him speak. He said, come out to my ranch, 4th of July weekend, 08. I'm having an open house. We're going to have uh, films and seminars and lectures in the day. And at night, well, sky watch. I went with a girlfriend, three days. During the day, it was like Nick Pope and Richard Dolan and William Henry and all these world famous people are talking. 
and showing films and slides and all, all these things. At night, they built a bonfire. And this is about a 250 acre ranch. And it's just nothing. It's, it's his house, nothing, and Mount Adams. So on the land, they built a fire and about 200 of us sat, sat, around, the, sat around the fire. They were playing guitars and tambourines and singing at night. And we were looking up at the sky. So the first night was Friday. We're looking up at the sky, hours and hours, and absolutely nothing happened. Okay. Next day, Saturday, lectures, film, seminars, look up at the sky, bonfire. We look at the sky, hours and hours. Out. And, you know, your neck hurts after a while when you're looking up. Saturday, nothing, hours. Third day, Sunday, lectures, film, seminars, Nick Pope, whoever it was, bonfire, looking up. And now we're looking up for about two hours the last day. And I said to myself, you know, if I move, if I get out of here right now, I can get my car out of this traffic jam and I'll beat all the, all the traffic. That's all. I had my key, car keys in my hand. The second I did that, a huge craft hovered over our heads, 200 people, a huge black craft. Now, I couldn't tell you how big it was or the shape because it was directly over our heads, jet black, and it blocked out the night sky entirely. At, underneath this craft was a it was like a silver crystal dome and the crystal silver do crystal glass dome i'm sorry glass dome lit up dark and very dark emerald green light like green from the wizard of oz and it beamed down this beautiful emerald green light over 200 people like this it was like eh, 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 eh. silent no 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 sound so we're looking up and we're getting bathed in this green, emerald green light. And I started crying, Devin. I, I started to cry. And I'm like, wow, they're here. They're real. And what the message I got was, um, we love you. We were in the neighborhood. We wanted to say hello. Don't be afraid. Everything's cool. Um, we're in the, just in the neighborhood. Be kind to one another. Be, be, go in peace. Uh, and we, 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 love, we love you. That was the message I got. I feel it in my heart, and I still feel it in my heart. This is 2008. So the craft was above us for maybe maybe a minute, minute and a half at the most. And then the light went off. It slowly went away, and then, phew, just vanished. Went right over Mount Adams and vanished. We all cried. People cried, hugging, kissing, dancing, singing. It was a profound moment in my life. It, 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 it was a, a life-changing moment in my entire life. That was 08. So then 07, so 017 is my dad died and I was inspired to write this book. And then after I wrote the book, I met uh, Stephen Bassett, who is now my best friend. And he and I created a group uh, called the Hollywood Disclosure Alliance. We launched the Hollywood Disclosure Alliance last year. It is comprised of 150 UFO researchers, experts, and uh, disclosure advocates. And we've blended them for the first time ever with Hollywood producers, screenwriters, directors, and performers. I created it. I thought of it. I'm the chairman. Steve Bassett is the executive director. Uh, Shirley MacLaine is in our group. Thomas Jane, the movie star, is one of my new best friends. He's in the group. Dee Wallace, the mother from E.T., the movie E.T., one of my best friends for 35 years. She's in there. Dave Foley is in the group. Uh, Devin, I'm glad to invite you into the group if you're interested. Absolutely get you in there. And we all have had live events and newsletters and, and Slack channels, and we're all talking to each other. The, the goal is to promote disclosure in the media. We want the next era of films, TV shows, documentaries, and even books to accurately, accurately reflect real-life UFO people, experiences, and stories, because... Uh, even my story from with my father, there's so many stories that have never been told to the public and the goal is to get them on a big screen. So anyone out there, go check out HollywoodDisclosureAlliance.org.org and you'll see everything there is to see there. We are a nonprofit corporation and uh, in less than a year, we've become something of a phenomenon. We, we will be at Contact in the Desert. We're doing a bunch of events there as well. Yeah, you, you talk about disclosure. A lot of people in the past think it's going to have to be the government to disclose, but now there's so many forms of private media 
that all it would take is like another Phoenix Lights type setting with everyone having cell phones now. You wouldn't need the government to disclose anymore. Well, that's a, that's very interesting that you said that. I'll, t- I'll tell you why. Last week, Lynn Kitai was a, I have my own podcast called Live from Hollywood. It's paranormal tonight. And Lynn Kitai was my guest last week. She is the queen of the Phoenix Lights. She saw them in, in real life. She took the only, uh, the, the best still photos and videos of the Phoenix Lights. And, she, you know, she's convinced that it's extraterrestrials from other, other worlds. And, you know, Phoenix Lights was 90, 97. So cell phones, you know, with, with, with cameras, early, early, early. If Phoenix Lights happened tonight, it would be on live news. It would be on CNN. It would be on Fox. It would be on, on, on MSNBC. It would be everywhere. And I think you're right, Devin. I really do. I think if that happened tonight, anywhere on the, on the planet, a huge undeniable event happened now. And uh, people would go, okay, clearly they're here. Clearly this is real. That's not a Chinese balloon. That's not an American drone. That's not Russian. Russians aren't quite as bright as be able to do, you know, three mile long craft. So I absolutely agree with you. I hope it happens. My mother's 90 years old. She'll be 90 in October. My mother's still alive. And she always says, I hope she hopes to live to see disclosure while she's still alive. My daughter's 34 and she wants to see disclosure. I'll be 68. So this is three generations in my family. We all want to, we're hoping to live to see that day. Now, people like Stephen Bassett, my partner, Danny Sheehan, the famous attorney in Washington, D.C., uh, Dr. Stephen Greer, of course. These people have been lobbying uh, Congress and, and Chuck Schumer and the GOP and President Biden and every president for years and years and years. Please, please, let's pass legislation so the whistleblowers can come out. We need more David Grushes. So far, David Grush is a unicorn. David Grush, uh, Fravor, and, and Graves. Okay, those three guys, but mostly Grush. Grush is a unicorn. He's one of a kind, man. In 80 years since Roswell, Grush is the only major person ever went in front of Congress and said, non-human craft exist, uh, non-human biologics exist, we have them first person only person that's ever said that that was a huge door for disclosure the new york times article december 7 2017 leslie kane and ralph blumenthal huge movement for disclosure the three videos from today's stars academy and and lou elizondo elizondo that they released huge step forward all of these steps forward are, are are happening but then three weeks ago the pentagon said there's nothing here there's no alien tech it's just a, it just doesn't exist. They keep fighting back against what we all, those of us who I've been studying this since 07, people in this field know that this is real. Major, major people, Richard Dolan, Nick Pope, Steve Bassett, Paul Hynek, uh, Dr. Avi Loeb from Harvard, uh, Gary Nolan from Stanford, major, major people know this is real. The fact that this is still covered up in 2024, I find that astounding, you know. Yeah, I've interviewed Avi Loeb. It's on this channel, and he's also come into your conference. So yeah, yeah, that's pretty yeah, cool. yeah. So, all right. So, I mean, it, you know, it's not my conference. I'm the publicist for Contact. I, I, I like that you just promoted me, Devin. That's pretty cool. I'm the publicist for Contact in the Desert. It's not my conference. I am the publicist for it. Um, Contactinthedesert.com. Please buy tickets. It's going to sell out. We're expecting three to four thousand people. We have every major UFO expert you could think of, with the exception of Eric Von Daniken, who's too old to travel, and, and Giorgio Tsoukalos, who uh, had a conflict. If you want to know about the UFO situation, come to Contact in the Desert, May 30 through June 3rd, Indian Wells, California, which is near Palm Springs. You'd have to fly into the Palm Springs airport. and. We will all be there. It's going to be remarkable. It's going to be the biggest UFO event in history of the planet. And uh, we're very, very excited, man. I hope you can come. I hope so, too. Palm Springs <laughs> is a very expensive flight from Ottawa, and it's a little short notice, but I'm definitely going to look into it. 
Now, if any ETs are watching this, uh, <laughs> what a better place to show yourself than at a UFO event. Oh, yeah. Where everyone's going to be so happy to cover it. Oh, you know what? Could you imagine, right, if, if the Phoenix Lights happened above the Renaissance Hotel during Contact in the Desert? Well, talk about the biggest story on the planet Earth. I mean, my God, would that be something? You know, again, I'm a publicist, so, you know, I've been doing events in Hollywood for literally for 40 years. But, Devin, if I had if I had a UFO or some aliens come to contact in the desert, I could say, you know what, I've done it all. I'm going to retire from PR now. I've done it all. Now, do they pay attention? Like I was just talking to Preston Dennett uh, on here the other day. You, he just had a number one best selling book. He's been to contact in the desert before. He says that there have been incidents instances of aliens going to conventions and dressing up and stuff. And they're kind of interested in what people think about like what's going on with them. Uh, that's the greatest thing I've ever heard in my life. I have absolutely no knowledge of that at whatsoever. I don't really have an opinion. Um, do I think hybrids exist on the planet earth? I really truly do. I truly do. Number one. Number two, I sound like Joe Biden because he always does number one, number two, number three. Number two, I have very close friends, very, very close friends who have been abducted in their lives by aliens and have had good experiences and, and bad experiences. And, and uh, starting, with, starting in childhood, I, uh, three, three friends in particular come to the top of my head. These are not crazy people. I know them very well. These are real people. This, they are not BSing, man. They've been abducted. So aliens are real for sure. Here's the theories on aliens. One, they're us from the future. Well, I think that's fantastic. I love that one so much. They're us from the future. Now, I think Einstein proved that, that uh, time travel could happen. So if they're us from the future, boy, they have two arms, two legs, two eyes, two ears, right? Nose and mouth. Essentially... They're us in a different form, but overall, the, their their physique is very similar to human beings. So if they're us from the future, I think that's the greatest thing I've ever heard ever in my life. That's number one. Number two, if they're from other galaxies and planets, well, of course, probably. Number three, they're interdimensional beings. Well, that explains why a lot of people are taken through doors and through ceilings and, and walls. You know, Whitley Strieber, I think, was taken through the roof of his house when he was abducted. Uh, so if they know how to change dimensions, well, that explains a lot. How many UFOs people have been have seen in the in the sky watching a UFO and it just it, it disappears? It's there, it disappears, it comes back, it disappears. Uh, if, well, if that's not interdimensional, how do they do that? So that's one. Another theory is that they, there are many UFO bases deep under the seas all over the world. I believe that strongly. Uh, there's, a, there's a UFO base near Catalina Island off the coast of Los Angeles. They've been seeing UFOs off of Catalina Island since the 30s or 40s. Um, there are, UF, there are U, USOs bases all over the world. That I'm convinced. Deep, deep, deep in the ocean. They so they, they all go underwater, don't they? Just to interrupt you for a second. It seems like pretty much all UFOs go underwater. I doubt uh, you should talk to Darcy Weir. Do you know who Darcy Weir is? He just did a no. documentary. I'll hook, I'll hook you up. Darcy Weir just did a documentary, Devin, called Trans Medium Fast Movers in USOs. He's an expert on USOs. I'm not. You should talk to him. I don't know that they can all go underwater, but it seems to me if they can travel from the future and interdimensionally and from billions of miles away, it seems to me probably they can go underwater as well. But a lot of UFOs oh, historically, Christopher Columbus, you know this, Christopher Columbus saw a UFO 1492. He's sailing to uh, North America. He saw one. It's in his journal. George Washington had an alien encounter before he became president during the Battle of Valley Forge. This stuff is just remarkable. If you look into this, th this stuff is just overwhelming and remarkable. And once you have a good handle on it, you think, why doesn't everyone on the planet have this information? That's what my group, Hollywood Disclosure Alliance, is trying to uh, promote. 
Yeah, I think crypto terrestrials is also another theory that these things actually have existed forever on the planets, just secretly, and we don't know about them. Have you heard that one? I've not heard that term. I've not heard that term. But I am a very, very big believer in Eric Von Daniken's theory and Zachariah Sitchin. They both came up with the same thing around the same time in the late 60s. They both said that extraterrestrials have been on planet Earth for hundreds of thousands of years, that they helped to craft, they helped to craft human beings. Now that explains a lot. You know, a lot of human beings have ESP, or, or I, I've I've had I've had some remarkable moments. In fact, I have a book coming out in May called My Paranormal Life. That's a whole nother story. But I've had numerous paranormal events throughout my life uh, that are can't be explained by just regular being an American human being, they're uh, supernatural things. But there's DNA in human beings that can't be explained. There are many people that have ESP or, 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 or can leave their bodies. Um, I strongly, oh, there was a study in the University of Chicago that 50,000 years ago, there was something called the great brain event, the great brain event. And that event was human beings 50,000 years ago, our brains increased in size by three in a very, very short period of time. And they said that would not have happened through natural, 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 natural Darwinism. That didn't happen that way. It was, it was created to happen that way. Well, if the ETs blended their DNA with, you know, the, the ape, ape men, we, we were ape men. We were making sticks and stones in caves. And, and, you know, when we saw fire, we were like, oh, my God. And then 50,000 years ago, we became like genius people. And, and, and we started creating remarkable structures and airplanes and go to the moon and digital. So I'm convinced that extraterrestrials had a hand in human beings. Eric Van Daniken and Zechariah Sitchin both said that. The Anunnaki came hundreds of thousands of years ago. They were a race that helped to craft mankind. The story of Adam and Eve apparently first man, first women, woman that the aliens created. They set them up in the Garden of Eden. I believe in God. I'm Jewish. I believe in God. There is a God. God created all things. But I believe extraterrestrials crafted mankind to, to where we are today as advanced as an advanced civilization. Yeah, it appears they definitely had a lot of influence over us. And a lot of the, I don't want to get into this too much, but a lot of religious incidents over the years could right. definitely it to me it's more believable in some of these situations that they were uh, visitors from other places trying to influence us um yeah. than than gods in, in many cases but we we won't go there today because there's well, a lot well, of stuff well to well well let me can, let's just can we just talk about moses yes okay yeah right. that's so, a very okay. good example moses is a great it kills me first of all Moses, okay, Moses part, all right. Moses uh, heard the voice of God from a burning bush, right? We all know that story. Moses saw God as a burning bush. Well, bushes don't burn, really, because it didn't consume the bush. It just was on fire. So the theory is that Moses saw a UFO on a mountain and the ET spoke to him. Okay, so that, that's the burning bush. That's, that's a pretty good story. Okay, Moses parted the Red Sea. Okay, now the my mother goes, it was low tide that day. I go, no, I don't think, Bum. I think there was a craft. Now, here, this is the very first, I have to read the first page of my book. Very first page of my book. If I can find it. Okay, from the book of Exodus, the Jewish Bible, book of Exodus. This is in the book of Exodus. The Lord went before the Israelites by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. That's about the Moses and the Israelites in, in, in the desert for 40 years. There was a pillar of cloud during the day. Now, what's a pillar? A pillar is a cigar-shaped UFO, okay? A long cylindrical craft. A pillar of fire by night. 
Well, that's not the sun. That's not the moon. That's not a star. A pillar of fire led the Israelites through the desert so that they would survive. Okay, now, that's extraterrestrials there. And another last thing, if you've heard the expression manna from heaven, and I write about manna from heaven in this book. Manna from heaven was God dropped down sticky balls of, 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 of flour and honey from the sky to feed the Israelites in, for the 40 years they were wandering in the desert. Now, a desert, there's no water, there's no food. How did the Israelites survive while they found from Egypt till the promised land? Manna from heaven. There, are, there were cra little crafts. The extraterrestrials had crafts in the sky that dropped down balls of, it's like wafer, they were like wafer honey balls. And that's what people lived on. That's where the expression manna from heaven comes from, the, the Hebrew Bible of Exodus. So Moses saw a burning bush. Okay, that was a UFO. Moses parted the Red Sea. That was a UFO. A pillar of fire led the Israelites through the desert for 40 years. That's clearly a UFO. Manna from heaven. Well, God could be generous. Of course, there is a God. But I don't think God was dropping balls of wafers and honey from heaven. I think that was probably extraterrestrials. And then the Ten Commandments, that's a hard one, the Ten Commandments. I think that they spoke to Moses and helped him out with the Ten Commandments, or maybe Moses was a genius and came up with the most incredible Ten Commandments by himself, the chiseling that, maybe he did that. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai to give the people the Ten Commandments, in the Bible, it says he was glowing. Moses was glowing. He also had been gone for, I forget how long, several weeks he was gone. Then he came back glowing with the Ten Commandments. He was taken on a craft and he went up and he, they told him, hey, Moses, you're important. We want to help you out with the Ten Commandments. You can help lead your people. We want to help you out. And when he came back, man, he, had, he was glowing and he had Ten Commandments. So just the story of Moses alone blows my mind. Clearly, there's extraterrestrials involved here. And it, 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 there's, I know I have a friend named Ella LeBane, Devin, you might want to talk to her. She's a biblical scholar. She studied the Bible, Old and New Testaments for 40 years. She knows every UFO and alien reference in the Old Testament and the New Testament. She's a biblical scholar and she's a friend of mine. You might want to talk to her. Yeah, I would definitely be open to that. As I said, I, I research this stuff literally every single day. So <laughs> I'm always interested. Okay. I'll hook you. I will hook and you I'm out. far from an expert. I only started being interested around 2014. But you mentioned that some of your abductee experiencer friends had negative and positive interactions in their abduction experience. Whitley Strieber who yeah. I just read his most re recent book, and he's coming to your convention. Yeah. Had a very negative one where he actually, and he, and he says it's bad that people make fun of him. He had allegedly anal tearing. Yet when when we hear like communication from ETs telepathically and otherwise, they always seem to be talking about the environment or love you. I don't think I've ever heard of like a negative one, but I have heard of of negative UFO encounters and negative ET encounters. And then there's the whole cattle mutilation stuff and animal yeah. mutilation. So, right. so what's your theory? Is it different breeds of uh, extraterrestrials with different intentions? Does it have to do with maybe the experiencers just don't understand what's happening to them in the negative situations? Then of course we, we hear of radiation burns and stuff and, and negative stuff happening with people that encounter the craft itself that don't necessarily have a interaction with people inside. But uh, right. if you could talk about that for a moment. Sure. Sure. I have a very good friend named Mark Glenn Moore. I'll be, I'll be interviewing him next week on my podcast, Mark Glenn Moore. He's about 60 years old, very successful businessman, Northern California. I met him last year when I was promoting my book. He's been taken by the Pleiadians, the beautiful, tall, white Nordic Pleiadians. Since the age of five, age of five, he met them in a park. 
His little brother had just died. He was playing in a park. He said a beautiful woman named Maya, M-A-Y-A, came up, came to him. He said the most beautiful woman you could imagine. And she took him on a huge craft. The male up there was Antar, A-N-T-A-R. And he said, my friend Mark said, he was put like in a classroom with lots and lots of other little kids. And they were shown a huge, I call it a digital blackboard. He said they were shown a huge screen. And the screen was like how to be kind to others, how to love others, how to be good to planet Earth, how to uh, be protective of the Earth's environment. He said they're the most beautiful, loving, warm, wonderful people you could imagine. He calls them the light people. He's been taken every few years for the last 55 years. Not every day, once in a while. He said he's now I know him. I've spent time with him. He's the real guy. He's real. He's a very successful businessman. He's a very talented musician. He's not crazy. He is not making this up. In fact, he's writing a book right now about his life. I'm helping him get a publisher for that book. So that experience, which is very interesting because in my book, I talk about two Pleiadians, a male and a female. They come to Earth in the near future and they solve all of mankind's problems. When Mark read my book, he goes, Dan, your book is my life story. He goes, how did you, how did you know this? I said, I don't know. It just came to me. He goes, Dan, I can't, I'm literally can't believe what you wrote because what you wrote in your book has been my life since the age of five. He said, you described the Pleiadians exactly. So there's Devin, there's like, that's the positive. That's the really good one. The really negative one was on your show, Alien Disclosure Files. I'm good friends with Camille Jane Harmon, James Harmon, Camille James Harmon. She was impregnated by aliens. They, and then months later, they took her fetus, and she was traumatized she, as a as a young child and as a teen. She's been traumatized her whole life. She her parents worked for NASA, and she said, "I saw her. I see her all the time." She said, "She's discovered that some other young ch children of of military people and of NASA people have been ab abducted," which is interesting because that's like. Uh, from if you if you know the X Files, uh, Mulder's uh, Mulder's little sister Samantha was abducted by aliens because Mulder's father worked for Majestic Twelve on the X Files. So I said, Camille, you sound you sound like Samantha Mulder from the X Files. So that's a po positive. Mar my friend Mark with the Pleiadians and my friend Camille impregnated. They took her fetus. What could be more horrible and, and invasive for a woman? Than that and i don't know i think they were the tall grays i'm guessing but i think she said they were the tall grays so that's the range of experiences um regarding radiation burns I, I don't think that's intentional i think some people out of curiosity just get too close and they should probably you should never touch a ufo that's on the ground with a bare hand but the guy peniston peniston from rendlesham forest peniston touched the one in rendlesham forest and he got a digital download of thousands of ones and zeros, which he wrote down in a book. And years later, they had the ones and zeros. And it was a message from the future. I think it said they were from the year, I think it's, they said they were from the year 8000 AD. So those are my answers. I hope I answered your question. Yes. Now, <laughs> you're, you're saying there's tons of, tons of, of different breeds. Apparently, uh, what, are, what are the main ones that are, what are visiting and any idea on the intentions of each one? And I'm, I don't mean to go into 30 plus or anything, but like maybe a couple of them. You mentioned the Nordics. Uh, you mentioned tall whites. You mentioned tall grays. And we've all heard of the, the short well, no, grays. No, right. Well, to, Nordics, Nordics, tall whites, Pleiadians, that's all the same race. The, the, that's one and the same. Pleiadians, tall whites, tall Nordics or Nordics. Apparently, that's all. Those are the kind, loving ones. And according to my friend Mark, he said, it's about dad. He goes, the women are so beautiful. You look at them and you cry. They're so, that's how beautiful they are. That's one race. The short grays are like, apparently they're drones, or what I've heard. They're drones. They're run on AI. They don't really, they have like a mission and then they fulfill the mission. They, they, they have no emotions. I think they kidnap, abduct people, just they're told to do that. 
the tall grays, I don't, is that a different race from the small grays? <laughs> you tell me, man. I don't have the slightest idea. Maybe the tall grays created the little grays to be their worker bees. I have no clue about that. Apparently, there's reptilians. The reptilians are supposedly in in the governments of the world, that the, the money people, the, the, the powerful, majestic 12 people, the people that run the world, keep the disclosure from happening, and majestic 12. Those are the, apparently, they're the reptilians. Uh, okay, maybe so. That's pretty interesting. Um, I think those are the, uh, the draconians, apparently, are, are a, a, an evil race that live deep inside the earth. Okay, fine. Then there's like- We the hear about the mantis too. Yeah, the, I was going to say the, in, the insectoids or the mantis, whatever. Yeah, or probably giant creatures that, you know, Devin, if you and I saw, we'd pee in our pants. We'd probably pee in our pants and faint if, if you know, what a, a praying mantis is coming at you. You're sleeping, right, in your room. And a fucking brain mantis is going to come and, and take you. Okay, so you'd be pretty frightened. Uh, that would scare me. That would scare. Me. A tall white, a Nordic. I would be thrilled to meet a Nordic. Uh, a tall gray might be interesting. I don't want to meet a, a brain. I don't want to meet a giant brain mantis. I'd rather not. Yeah, and I don't know if what you believe about Charles Hall, the the guy that supposedly worked with with tall whites, but he says. His first encounters with with tall whites were were terrifying as well, and just because you're seeing this different race uh, of creature for the first time, and it's like it's quite shocking. Well, how old was? Do you know how old Char, Char, Do you know how old Charles was the first time? Because my friend Mark was five, right, and his brother had just died, and his parents were in mourning, so he was playing in a park, probably very sad little tiny boy and this beautiful maya came and he was thrilled so he was five i don't know how old charles was but it doesn't sound he, like he was five he says he was in the military in his early 20s working as a weather observer on dream dreamland which i think he says was part of area 53 and as a it was a he claims that there was a tall white base and as a weather observer he was the only one out there. I think I I've seen him on TV. I I, I think I yeah. Know he's had mean. a documentary. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I have. I didn't know his name. Uh, so you know, when you're older, you have your own thoughts about God. Uh, you might probably have your own thoughts about your religion, how your parents raised you, or your teachers, or your friends, how you were raised. And if you're in your twenties and you're not aware that there are probably I think there's two or 300 races. In fact, Devin, Ella LeBain knows how many races there are. I got to hook you up, man. She's way smarter than I am. There are, I think there's a, a few hundred races, apparently, of different aliens. But if you're in your 20s and you're in the military and you're out there and you see a tall gray, a tall white running around, well, that could be pretty scary. I, I might be scared unless they came up and said, hi, my name is, you know, Jorthon and I, I wanted to meet you. Don't be alarmed. Otherwise, yeah, I, I I could see that why he would be frightened. It wasn't in his, you know, it wasn't in his life experience or his childhood. You know, again, when I when I when I met Giorgio in 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 uh, 07, I was 51 years old. You know, I was raised Jewish. Uh, 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 I never thought about aliens. I had forgotten the 70 sighting with my dad. Completely forgotten. And when Giorgio is saying ancient astronaut theory and the petroglyphs and the cave drawings and Nazca lines and the crop circles and Stonehenge. And you see all of this together. And I, li I literally was cry I had tears. And I, I said to Giorgio, wow, you just changed my entire view of the world that day. And I meant it. And to, from that day till today, I have been studying this stuff, getting my hands on as many books and documentaries as I can. And I'm friends with Richard Dolan and Nick Pope and Steve Bassett and Paul Hynek and Katie Page and Earl Anderson. These are my some of my closest friends now. I have I have embraced this very, very thoroughly. But to anyone who's interested in this topic, read, 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 read. There are so many great books. Ryan Wood just put out a book, The History of Recovered Military UFOs. It's 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 it's, it's fantastic. Ryan Wood, check that out. Uh, Whitley Strieber's books, Richard Dolan's books, 
Um, Kathleen Martin, a friend of mine, she wrote a book, The Betty and Barty Hill Story with Stanton Friedman. Read that. Read Zechariah Sitchin. Read Eric Von Daniken's original Chariots of the Gods. Read my book, After They Came. Read. Go to UFO TV. There's a streaming channel. I'm friends with the owner. He just joined the Hollywood Disclosure Alliance on the board, Tim Crawford. Join UFO, you know, Street Watch UFO TV. There are thousands, Devin, you probably know, there are thousands of documentaries up there. I watched one the other day on Travis Walton. And, and, and the first time I ever saw him describe in, in great detail what happened to Travis Walton in 1975 in Arizona. You I've can... interviewed Travis <laughs> and I've interviewed Nick Pope and they're yeah. both coming to your convention. Right. Well, not yours, but you're the publicist for it. Just to give my, that my, a quick shot. Right. Exactly right. That's exactly right. <laughs> but I got to ask you, I mean, we'll leave the fans hanging there. I'm, I'm sure we'll just give a tease here and we'll have you on again. Great. I'd love um, to make them want more, but flirting with fame is your other book. And I'm sure we could do a whole podcast. I'd on, love to. Uh, I could tell you encounters, but could, could you just briefly talk about some of the celebrities uh, you sure. mentioned? This probably may not have been as a publicist, but you had contact with Kiss before, which is pretty damn cool. Right. So other than the 1970 sighting with my dad, the UFO in 1940, put that over here. That's entirely separate from the, from the rest of my life. I've been a Hollywood publicist for 40 plus years. And in high school, before I was a publicist, I ran a concert hall in Asbury Park, New Jersey, called the Sunshine Inn. I had long hair. I played the drums. I ran the lights. And I did stage crew, me and my best friend. Well, Bruce Springsteen played there all the time, okay, before he was famous. So we worked with Bruce Springsteen before he was famous. He was a bar band. He played at the Sunshine Inn quite often. My friends and I knew Bruce Springsteen. So starting with that alone, I was 15 years old. So start there. I worked with Kiss, their very first concert ever that was not in New York City. I, I met Gene Simmons then, and I met him again a few, a few years ago. And I said, Gene, I met you in 1973 at the Sunshine Inn at Asbury Park. He goes, don't you mean 1873? Because he was, a, he was tired. I worked with Fleetwood Mac. Before they were before they were famous, I worked with Kit, uh, Humble Pie, Jay Giles, Deep Purple, Mott the Hoople, Edgar Winter, Renaissance, Focus, Jay Giles. I mean, I worked with every major seventies band that I loved when I was 15, 16, 17, and eighteen. So that's my teenage years. Then I went to Boston University, studied communications. Well, Howard Stern was at my college when I was at my college. Okay, so I went to college with Howard Stern. After college, I came to California. I met Jerry Seinfeld bef 10 years before he was famous. I knew Jerry Seinfeld before he was famous. And in my book, it's all my celebrity. I worked at the Playboy Channel. I worked with Hugh Hefner for years. I knew Hugh Hefner. I knew Playboy Bunnies, and I had just gotten married. So as a straight guy. That sounds like a dream job. Well, Devin, I'm a straight guy. I just got married and I'm working at Playboy with naked girls and I just got married. OK, bad, bad timing. Very, very bad timing. I worked at Columbia Pictures. I worked at the American Film Institute. I worked at Playboy. I worked at two huge PR firms in, in Hollywood. I was Jay Leno's publicist when he got The Tonight Show. Uh, I've worked with Spielberg. I've worked. I've met uh, Mel Brooks. Jerry Seinfeld, Steve Allen, Milton Berle, uh, uh, Brooke Shields, I worked with her several times. Uh, Gilligan and the Skipper. I worked with the guy that did the special effects for Beetlejuice and won an, won an Oscar. I worked with, uh, I, I've had, I knew I was friends with Mickey Dolenz. Mickey Dolenz from the Monkees. When I was 10, he was my hero, and he's the reason I played the drums. 20 years later, Monkeys came in 66. 20 years later, 1986, I'm working at Columbia Pictures and Mickey Dolenz was a director and my childhood hero and I used to have lunch together. And I'm like, Mickey, you have no idea what you meant to me when I was 10. I've been playing the drums my whole life because of you. He goes, that's really cool, man. I hear that all the time. <laughs> so I've had quite I a remark. I love the monkeys, by the way. I still do. 
I, I walk five miles every other day, and I swear to God, the monkeys are on my iPod. So flirting with fame and daydream believers. One of my favorite songs. One of the greatest songs. <laughs> one of the best songs of all time. I'm a believer. Daydream believer. Uh, there's so many good ones. Pleasant Valley Sunday. I got to see all four monkeys in '86. They reunited, and I got backstage and I saw all four monkeys play uh, Pleasant Valley Sunday. Man, I cried. I actually cried as a grown man. I cry a lot, Devin. You can tell. My books are both on Amazon. Flirting with Fame and After They Came. My name is Dan Harari. Check out HollywoodDisclosureAlliance.org. Check out Dan Harari Author Author.com. Dan Harari Author. You can see all about me and my books and all that kind of cool stuff. And I'd love to hear from you. I have a podcast every Thursday night called Live from Hollywood. It's Paranormal Tonight. Uh, last week I interviewed Nick Pope and Lynn Kitai. This week will be Katie Page. Devin, do you know Katie Page? Don't oh, know. She's she I'll was the head of. She was the head of MUFON Colorado. She has some remarkable stories. She, as a child, was at a ranch. She lived on a ranch comparable to Skinwalker Ranch. She has really great stories. If you listen, if you need guests, just reach out to me because I, I could get well, you guests I, I'm all day long. I'm in this field. It's not like wrestling, so it, it's great to <laughs> And I don't know you. anything about wrestling. You teach me that, and I'll teach you this. And that'll be There's actually deal. quite a crossover with wrestling fans and UFO fans. I would say 30% of wrestling watchers are probably interested that's great in, in See, I, didn't, I didn't know i didn't know until you told me very cool well great to meet you great to talk with you and we'll definitely have to have you on again the next two nights we have uh two other guests which right. i'm which i'm excited about at 8 right. p.m eastern Tomo tomorrow is ron, Jan ron janix is the owner of contact in the desert exactly and uh, Wednesday night is my partner in the Hollywood Disclosure Legend, Stephen Bassett. Stephen is like the godfather of disclosure in Washington. So uh, if you want anybody else, brother, just let me know, man. Hey, any anyone that, that in your opinion is good and would be interested, I'm, I'm definitely open to because I, I always like learning more about this. As I said, it's been like 10 years that I, I first started, became interested when the Canadian government admitted that there's UFOs in the sky, yeah. but said that they're going to leave it up to uh, US. amateur astronomers and scientists yeah. to do their own research. And I'm like, how how is this possible? You're admitting that this exists, but you don't care anyways. I, that, that's why that, there are bigger, there are nefarious reasons. You know, so this, some people think that the aliens, the, this I like this theory, I think Avi Loeb said this, the aliens themselves have told the US and Israeli and British and the major governments, don't disclose us yet, we're not ready, we don't want you to tell them yet. Now, think about that. If, if they are telling our leaders not to disclose, that would be a good reason, because maybe they, the aliens have a reason. So, so many people, millions of people know this is true, but the leaders, the key, the key keepers to this information, maybe either the aliens are evil and are going to come kill us and eat us, or the aliens themselves don't want to be disclosed. I think that's an interesting premise. That would make sense because if they really wanted to be known, oh, they yeah. could easily do it. It wouldn't be that hard in this day. Like we saw about what was it, nineteen fifty-two. When they went over the White oh, House, and they, it was, oh yeah, yeah, it was in the newspapers. If they did that today, I oh, mean, God. this would. There's no way that the whole world wouldn't believe in it. It's like you but, said earlier. It's like you said earlier. If the Phoenix Lights happened today, it would be it would be undeniable, right? It would be undeniable. It happened a little early on the digital media, <laughs> just a hair. But any big event that happens now that's on live. Do you, do you ever see one of my favorite movies and my daughter too is signs do you know that movie signs i've heard of it but i haven't seen oh uh, david my brother you've got to watch signs signs is such a great movie mel gibson and joaquin phoenix watch signs and next time i come on to promote my other book in may we'll discuss signs but it, it, it's very much aliens come they're in the skies it's in it's undeniable the news is all over the world and it's how do people react once they're here, once they're here, what do people do then? People wouldn't even care 
it would be a big deal for a week and forgotten. No, I don't think so, Mike. Mark. I, I don't agree with that either. But uh, the, yeah, we'll get into more next time. Contact in the desert is is the big event Doc, coming up. Contact in the desert dot com. Get your tickets now, right? Thank you for yeah. Exactly. You can close this up with whatever you want to tell the fans. Okay, yeah. Uh, if you're interested in this subject, come to Contact in the Desert, May 30 through June 3, Indian Wells, California. It's about an hour and a half drive from LA. You go into Palm Springs, gorgeous, gorgeous resort. Every major UFO researcher in the world will be there. And if you want to learn about this subject, I went last year for my first time and I, 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 my mouth was open. I couldn't believe it. And I know this field. So you, if you want to learn more, go, 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 go. Contact in the desert. Get your tickets now. Look for me. I'll be all over the place, Dan Harari. And Devin, thank you, thank you, thank you for this. It's great to meet you. We will be friends forever and ever. And uh, I'll hook you up with some people, absolutely.